Hello, and you are listening to FPCast, the podcast for fruitless pursuits where we bullshit about the week in pop culture. I'm Luke. And I'm Jacinta. And this week we're talking about... Movies, movies, television, television, collectibles, collectibles, video games, video games, comics, comics, board games, board games, and more, and more. Cowboys. Gun violence. So much gun violence. So much gun violence. But entertaining gun violence, not mm. the real world gun violence. Yeah. Just fun gun violence. Yeah. Fun with guns. Hollywood gun violence. Fun with guns in the sun. In the sun. Mm. In the air. We saw hell or high water. Mm. They're the only two options. Yeah. We saw yeah. one of those. Which one? Yeah. You'll have to listen to find mm. out. Hype was high water. Uh, and also, look, lots of news, lots of trailers. In fact, we're going to review a couple of films. We are. Hell yeah. or High Water, Train to Busan, Busan. 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 Yeah, they're catching up on that one. That one came out, obviously, yeah, a couple of weeks, months ago. And my favourite movie of the year, The Greasy Strangler. So lots of fun things to talk about today. I almost feel like we should stop any unnecessary preamble and get straight into this puppy. Well, I feel... Well, you can't get into puppies, Luke. Why not? Um, Because the RSPCA doesn't like that. A lot of people on the internet are into puppies. (sighs) Yeah, I know. They're so yiffy. I'm into kitties. Yeah, you're so weird. Um, <laughs> so, so how's skipping that uh, awkward preamble going? <laughs> yeah, I'm getting there. <laughs> All right. So, uh, news. Let's mm-hmm. talk about the news. We're mm-hmm. not talking about current events or meaningful things that are happening to people in the world. We're talking about movie news, video game Trivial news. Trivial bullshit. Uh, things that people of our year shouldn't really give a shit about. But, uh, hey... You're listening to it. That should be our slogan. <laughs> but you're listening to hey, it. Shrug. You're listening to it. <laughs> it uh, should just be the title of the podcast. It should be, yeah. Because yeah. we F-P-Cast, next year. as we said before, are very poor branding. Mm. You know, and especially ironic that at the beginning I usually say the official podcast for Fruitless Pursuits because there's all those bootleg versions of it out there. <laughs> Hola! <laughs> Hola, mi amigo. So, uh, we have our Lando Mm. in the Miller and Lord directed Han Solo movie coming out in 2018, Mm -hmm. I believe. That sounds right. Episode 8 next year. Han Solo the year after that. And uh, we knew, obviously, because it's about a young guy, Han Solo, taking place before New Hope, we have to learn in this movie about everything that we've taken for granted so far. Mm. I need to know how we got the Millennium Falcon, mm-hmm. how he fell in love with Chewbacca, yes. how he uh, hung around with Lando and how they probably did some gambling. And mm-hmm. um, I want to know about like how we got in debt with Jabba the Hutt. Mm. I hope there's some Lobot backstory. There's just not enough uh, Lobot love. I'm hoping Lobot's hanging out with them <coughs> and Lobot is like, he just won't shut up. Mm. Like, you know, he's yep. the kind of... He's played by Ryan Reynolds. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In full, like, um, Wolverine Origins... Yeah, like, bald cap. Bald, yeah. Yeah. And he's... Or, it could be ironic, the other option is to give him more hair than one of those, tr- like, trolls. Oh, yeah, okay. Troll dolls. Yep. And he just won't shut up, this mm-hmm. guy. And you're like, Lobot, <laughs> come on. And then... Lobot, uh, more like Lolbot. The Imperials, like, they can never hit anything. Yeah. And, um, they, you know, they're aiming for Han mm. and, boom, shoot Lobot's ears off. Okay. And then as he starts to go into a kind of, like, um, annoying Chris Tucker-esque rant about it, <laughs> gets his tongue shot off accidentally uh, as well. Yeah. And then forever is mute and has to have those things on his ears. Mm. You don't have to see the movie now. I've pretty much laid it all out for you. I think that's what's going to happen. But uh, Lando has been cast, and um, it is... Donald Glover. The ghost of Gary Coleman. (laughs) As we did mention, I think it was a couple of months ago that it did did. come out, there was rumours for Donald Glover, and I think at the time we were pretty positive about those rumours. And this is official. My only thing was I was saying, like, you know, maybe he's a tricky character in the sense that you don't want it to be the parody Lando that we see now, Mm. because he was such a product of the early 80s. Um, and really, like, uh, leftover of the disco 70s, mm. you kind of now think of him as this, like, space pimp, and you kind of 
but the character as created wasn't created necessarily as a space pimp. All that mm. stuff was earnestly designed and done to be, um, you know, ref- reflect yeah. the yeah. And trends at the time. They'll probably eventually, you know, they'll probably scope it so that he is a, you know, just a regular kind of smuggler character, and then when he gets to Bespin, that he's the, that's his... Cloud City? Yeah. That's his, that's his dealio. When he becomes the king of Cloud City, that's when he goes full pimp mode. But prior to that, he was just a normal dude. Well, I expect to see the origins of all he, his things as well. I want to see mm. those first moustache bristles uh-huh. um, sort of coming through. Mm-hmm. And I want to see... And Chewbacca, actually. Why not make him... Like a naked mole rat. Just, yeah, yeah. and tiny. Now, I know that Chewbacca is shown as a big furry adult in uh, Revenge of the Sith which happens before this, but, you know, all sorts of things could happen. Groot was a great big tree, now mm. he's just a little toddler. Yeah. Um, same thing with Benjamin Button. So, mm-hmm. it's aliens, let's be open-minded, mm. you know? Let's not make assumptions mm-hmm. uh, about these sorts of things. So, I want to see that. I want to see... Look, they're smugglers, right? There's a point where you're sort of looking down at your pants and going... I could fit a lot more in this if they were flared at the bottom. Because, mm-hmm. obviously, he doesn't have a lot of room... Uh, up the top, uh, he's, to already, he's already he's already packing, already smuggling uh, one big salami. Yeah. He's not a big uh, sorry Star Wars. Um, I could say space uh, salami, also known as the Dianoga, trying <laughs> to strangle Luke mm-hmm. in the uh, big bulging one eye mm-hmm. uh, at the top. Um, Lucas was a weird dude, right? Mm. So repressed. Even the the asteroid worm thing that was very peeny. Yeah. Yeah. And I still reckon they must have flown through its bum hole. No, they came out its mouth, didn't they? Yeah. Came out its mouth. They, they what, went what? in its mouth. I think they went in its bum hole no. and flew out its mouth. No. I think, like, this was some proto-human centipede kind of stuff happening there. Pretty sure they flew in its mouth and flew out its mouth. Uh, but you didn't see teeth when they flew in. Well, because it had its mouth open. When his mouth's open, when yeah, they fly then, out, yeah, you can yeah. see the teeth. Yeah, because it's closing. Because it, the mouth is closing as they are flying out. It was just so open that they couldn't even see that shit. Yeah. Sounds like my ex-wife. <laughs> oh! uh, anyway, Donald Glover, I cannot wait to see the first picture of these guys in costume ready to go for this thing. Mm-hmm. And it must start shooting, I would say, probably got to be early next year. They're going to mm-hmm. need a year uh, pre-production, post-production. Post pre, it worked the way you remember it. Post <laughs> pre cum, post cum. yeah. Oh my god! Well, it's like one of those little things. Like every good boy deserves fruit, <clears throat> which makes that pre cum taste better. Ah, ah, ah! Deadpool too. Mm. He would love this. Kind oh, of, he would. Kind of. I think I yep. was had a little bit of Deadpool around me for a second. Yeah. Then oh breaking the fourth wall um just while we're talking about casting these things are always take with a grain of salt but the donald glover one that came true Mm. so this isn't about like news this is about i want your opinion so domino is going to be in this Mm -hmm. that's deadpool's like uh i think it's cable's love interest deadpool's love interest when i was reading comics in the early 90s cable was in the bath with deadpool Okay. They were definitely getting it on. Mm-hmm. But then a friend I, I know has gotten a picture from a comic tattooed on a leg, which is Deadpool and Domino getting it on. Oh, okay. So, mm. sounds a bit easy, this Domino. Well, no, maybe she's just a liberated woman. Oh. And can do whatever the fuck she wants. Maybe she'll have to go up against a villain called the Slut Shamer. <laughs> the Meninist. Anyway, she's like a mutant. Mm. And she's sort of white. And she's got a... Um, black circle over one eye. Like a Dalmatian. Yeah, she's kind of got a a bit of a puppy vibe (laughs) going on. But she's cool. I was hoping that when a whole time I was watching Deadpool and I'm sort of seeing Marina Backer in and I'm thinking, well, what's her deal? What's going to happen to her? And then especially spoilers for a movie that you should have seen by now and, um, you know, when she sort of goes into that machine towards the end, Mm. I'm thinking she's going to get changed maybe Mm. something. But no. Uh, but, but this is the short list. Um, Sienna Miller, mm-hmm. El- Mary Elizabeth Winstead, Lizzie Kaplan, Sylvia Hoax, I don't know who that is, uh, Bond girl Stephanie Sigmund, don't know that one either, or um, Sophia Batella, who was in Kingsman and Star Trek Beyond. Mm. She was the alien. Yeah. All pretty good choices. Uh, obviously, I want Mary Elizabeth Winstead just for the hot toy. 
Yeah, but like, there's no real grounding in any of this, is it? It's just like, oh, there's there's going to be a female character. Here are some women. Yeah. Really? like With, with shortish dark hair, just yeah. like Domino. Yeah. Or because, certainly in terms of Mary Elizabeth Winstead and, because and Lizzie Because you can't um, cut or dye your hair. No, well, it's discouraged. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so it, you can only cast people who already have uh, similar traits to the character. It's a good yeah. idea. I mean, that's why Patrick Stewart was perfect for mm. Professor Rex. Yeah. And why he also played Hitman uh, mm-hmm. and um, Lex Luthor in that last Batman movie we saw. Yeah. Uh, everyone bald. Yeah. He plays. He's just, they've just got him on speed dial. Uh, when he played, when he was Heisenberg. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, a lot of people don't realise that. Like, mm-hmm. pre cancer, what's his face is out there doing his thing. Mm-hmm. Every time, you know, he takes his hat off, they do a cut, mm. quick cut. You'll never see him take his. Like, hat off in one shot. Yeah. It'll always be, like, change angle or a reaction shot mm. of, like, um, you know, Jesse Pinkman going, whoa, Go, whoa bitch. Yeah, whoa, yeah. bitch. And then yeah. um, it's Patrick Stewart. But he's so good. Yeah. That he really sells that head. Well, you just you just go, you roll yeah. with it. And mm. they put, the, of course, they put the glasses and the moustache on him or whatever. They're not idiots. Mm. I mean, there's some movie magic mm. there. Um, but he has to have to grow that moustache. Mm. Do they do a split? Because I don't know if you should grow a moustache or stick on a moustache if you don't already have a moustache. Mm. Like if you yeah, maybe they do like the composite, like facial composite. Yeah, like yeah. if you weren't born with a moustache, I don't know if you should have one. Well, in a movie, that's right. Yeah, in a role. Mm. Yeah, very confusing that movie business. Uh, but is there someone in that list that you, that you would prefer for this character you don't really know or care about? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's production company uh, making a Captain Planet movie because he likes the environment and stuff. Yeah, interesting call by Leo. If one of our listeners is five or six, um, how would you describe Captain Planet? Uh, Captain Planet, uh, that was it's like early 90s. Mm. That's his deal, yeah. And obviously that's sort of a time when everyone's kind of realising that perhaps that we are actually fucking the planet up quite a bit. Um, and so there's this nice little propaganda cartoon to make kids uh, give a shit about the planet, and which I loved. I loved this thing when I was a kid. We used to um, play around at lunchtime. We all used to divvy off into... Um, our Captain Planet characters. I was always uh, Linka, and Linka. She Link- the Russian, the like Swedish or something. I think the wind, wind, wind. Yeah, wind, wind. I think that's Russian. <laughs> and um, yeah, so they uh, there was five of them. There was Earth, Wind, uh, fire, fire, Water, or, and uh, Heart. Heart. <laughs> which, the, the, the true fifth <laughs> element, <laughs> which came with a monkey friend. And that was Kwame. Um, no, that was Mati. Kwame was Earth. Really? Yes. Mati was the little... Mati was the little kind of was... Mexican-y, yeah. kind of South American-y guy. Yes. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, so it was Wheeler, Linker, or... Uh, the, just... Amer- the American guy was Fire. Yeah, that was Wheeler. Because he was always firing his guns mm. into the air. Mm. And, and then there was, yeah, Kwame, Mati... And then there was... I can't remember... The, there was a you know, little Asian girl. I can't remember her name. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know who yeah. you mean. Yeah. So there's there's those guys. And uh yeah, they saved the planet against uh like polluters and like oil company tycoons well, and well, stuff well, like that. They put their powers together to yes. summon Captain Planet. Yeah. Who's this guy? He's got blue skin and a green mullet. Yeah. 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 He's so cool. And this isn't just gonna be like a straight take on this thing. Apparently it's gonna be an ironic, kind of funny, amusing take and the idea is that he's this washed up hero mm. that really needs these kids more than they need him at this mm. point. Yeah, because I guess if there was a take where it was like everyone's kind of a bit jaded about um, saving the planet and they're not so much, uh, you be- know... Because global warming's a myth. Absolutely, yeah, but that's the thing. They go, if they, they're fighting against all these keyboard warriors... Who try and try and tell everybody that uh, global warming's a myth and yeah. recycling doesn't do anything... Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. whole so. third act is Captain Planet punching SJWs in the face. Yeah. Because he sees the error in his, his ways. Yeah. Yeah. And and Gaia is there just going, well, fuck, peace out. You guys deal with this. I'm off to somewhere else. Gaia. Can't we just have a guy? Because... I know, uh, like, it's there in the name, Sounds like it? a very feminist agenda. It does. Like, Mother Earth? Fuck. Uh, hello. Uh... You know, I believe God created the Earth, yeah. and uh, I think he's got a pee-pee. 
Well, I don't know. Isn't God Alanis Morissette? Isn't that what Kevin Smith told us? Oh, he's such an SJW, <laughs> isn't he? Yeah. What a cuck. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, I fucking hate that word. Oh. <laughs> uh, Everybody's saying this stuff. It's just <laughs> such parroting. It's like you didn't come up with any of this stuff and you're just parroting, well, I don't know, what you read on Twitter, somebody said, mm. and then you're like, I'm going to come in there and say these things that other people are saying and that's going to show you. I read it on the Twitter feed of that guy who writes Dilbert. He must be right. Yeah. So anyway, look forward to that. And other movies to look forward to. Are uh, they going to make a Willy Wonka prequel? Fucking why? Yeah. Yeah. Do we do we need to know how the grandparents ended up in the bed? Like, is that is that where what's happening? Or how? Well, that'd be more know? of a Charlie prequel, wouldn't it? Like how Charlie was conceived. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, but maybe, maybe there, they can be there parallel stories, stories. Yeah. Aren't there stories in- intrinsically entwined? Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. I think you're right. I mm. think yes, definitely. I want to see why they end up in the bed. Yeah. I, I want to see uh, baby and if, Charlie. And if it's just the, the natural ageing process, I don't want to fucking know that. Charlie's conception. Yeah. He said, now look, Tim Burton's Willy Wonka, which I don't believe this is attached to, uh, has a bit of a flashback prequel kind of thing into it anyway. I, they show, I can't remember. They show that his father was a dentist, played mm-hmm. by Christopher Lee. Okay. Who was always telling him not to have sweet things. He, he was oh, yeah. not allowed to have sweet things because mm-hmm. it would fuck up his teeth. Yeah. Of course you're going to go off and start a chocolate factory if, if that's the sort of mm. thing you get as a, a youngster. Mm. Also shows him trekking through a jungle and, you know, and he slices a big flying mosquito thing in half and he finds the Oompa Loompas. Mm. And he takes them from the jungle to, to go and work in the factory, which mm. is mentioned in the, the original text. Mm. Um, I say text because it's really my Bible because mm. I eat a lot of chocolate. Yep. So what else they're going to put on, I don't know. But I think Hollywood very unsuccessfully tried to imitate Lewis Carroll earlier in the year. <laughs> that was an absolute fucking mess. You can hear me ranting about that uh, previously. Um, just in the fact that they were completely unable to capture the spirit or intent of those Alice in Wonderland works, at least as I understand them from a literary perspective Mm -hmm. and uh i I can't imagine that they're going to be able to just easily jump into the style of roald dahl unless they get you know get someone pretty fucking sharp to do this Mm. and uh you might want to go over the pond as you say uh (laughs) there it's just that's my tip like go and find someone yeah over there that uh He's going to have a better understanding of the, the feel. Because, um, to be fair, I think that Steven Spielberg actually produced a, a pretty um, faithful and, uh, you know, very nicely crafted Roald Dahl story with BFG. Mm. But, you know, he had a book to work with. If There's no prequel book. Mm. So, come on. And lots of songs, please. Mm. Yeah. Make it a little weird and dark. Yeah, maybe a bit less Johnny Depp. I did no like, Johnny Depp. I did, like I know a lot of people kind of hated that Tim Burton one. I I still I enjoyed it. I thought it was quite good. I mean, it's very different, obviously, and people don't like things that are different and change their childhood. But um, no, I I quite I enjoyed it. It's probably the last thing that I really enjoyed from Johnny Depp. People don't understand this a lot of the time, but uh, you know, and, and they're going to be quite. This is controversial. What I'm about to say, I like both versions. Mm. As do I. Mm. I like both. I, f- I feel like I'm not shitting on Gene Wilder's name by saying that I enjoyed the Johnny Depp. Yeah. Charlie, Willy Wonka, Charlie and Chocolate Factory, whatever the fuck it's called. Yeah. I like both Ghostbusters too. Hmm? But I don't like both Total Recalls and I don't like both Robocops. Yeah. Swings and roundabouts. Fair enough. Swings and roundabouts, governor. I will slay your monster. It's almost like you can enjoy two different flavours of the same type of icy pole. Mm. Mm. It's weird. Weird, I know, but... Yeah, I I don't feel comfortable with you saying that. Okay. Uh, Red Dead 2, video game. Video games? A a bit of video game news, but uh, God, look, this has taken the world by storm. This is the announcement that everybody wanted to hear. Mm. It's the announcement I wanted to hear as someone that doesn't give a shit about games. Because even though I don't give a shit about games, I sure give a shit about Red Dead Redemption. 
And what great timing as well. Just when we're all watching Westworld going, <laughs> yeah. I wish I could run amok in the Wild West and um, just do whatever I want to, to people, places and things. Yeah. So the, the first one is, what's the character's name? John Marsden? Yeah. Yeah. And you're... Is it? Marsden, yeah. Pretty sure it's Marsden. He's yeah. an Australian author. And, uh, oh yeah. You wrote Tomorrow When the War Began, John Marsden. Yeah. I'm sure it's John Marsden, though. Anyway, okay. anyway, um, yeah, he's a dude. He's lost his wife and kids, and he's on some sort of quest to fucking I don't know, do something or other. I never finished the game as much as I did love it, but uh, yeah, has there been an announcement whether this is a sequel or a prequel or? Um, I believe a sequel. I think the assumption is you'll be playing his son. Okay, cool. I actually controversially, and I'm just really putting this out there because I, I don't know if that this is true or not, but. I kind of almost want to go into that sort of thing just as a simulation and let me make my own character and my own stories, which you do do to an extent anyway. Mm. Um, And that's part of the problem for me with Red Dead is that that world is so wonderful that I barely got anywhere in the story because I would just get Mm. sidetracked and run off and do my own thing. Yeah, that's what I... I literally only barely got past the first section because I would get into the game and go, okay, so I've got like maybe an hour or something, I'm going to play this game. It's like, well, no, I'm not going to get stuck into storyline. I'm going to go and, you know, hunt something and get its pelt or whatever. And um, because it is such a beautiful world, you do spend so much time in it that you get so weirdly invested. And I heard this story from, you know, a lot of people that you get so attached to, say, your horse... Yeah. Right, and you're riding around. And one day I was riding around. I'd had this horse that I'd like stolen from some guy with a wagon. It was like a paint horse, so it was all different to all the other horses out there. And that motherfucker got killed by a mountain lion. I was so devastated that I don't think I ever really recovered, and that's half the reason I never got, went back to it. I would find no humor in this in real life, but in that game, I really like punching a horse. That's so mean. I know, that but poor it's little so computerized fun. horse. And even better is playing multiplayer and punching your friend's horse. That's so awful. I was going to say that, um, you know, I'd feel even better to have it sort of customised. But then when you think about the last Grand Theft Auto, that really gave us the best of all worlds because the characters were really great and the Mm. story missions were really great. But then they've got a really deep multiplayer thing where you can be your own character as Mm. well and hang out with your friends and customise everything. Yeah. So Rockstar are pretty good at, just as we said before, like, let's have both. Mm. You don't have to pick one or the other. It's, oh, I wish it was this, and but maybe it's that. I just think from the trailer, the, the bits we saw, it looks rich, it looks beautiful. Mm. I, I just want to jump in there and, and mess around. That's and such a great... Yeah, such a great game as well to play with friends. I've got great memories of playing Red Dead with uh, groups of uh, dudes and riding around on horses together and mm. punching each other off railway tra- onto railway <laughs> tracks and off bridges. And... Yeah, I think you, you got the game before I did and you were like, watch this, watch this, and you went into like a saloon or something, got a prostitute and put her on the train tracks. That was my first introduction to uh, Red Dead Redemption. That doesn't sound like something. <laughs> and again, look, it's the Westworld fantasy, except mm-hmm. it only costs 80, 80 bucks. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Can't Perfect. wait. But I'm going to have to wait at least a year. And, um, oh, God, like, we don't normally talk that much about video game things. The the podcast has morphed more into a movie podcast, but uh, the Nintendo Switch looks pretty cool. Um, mm. I'm impressed with that. Um, if you haven't seen it, Google it. It's a kind of tricky thing to get your head around. It's the new Nintendo console, and it's a console that you have in front of your TV, and you plug into your TV, and you're playing with a controller, but then you go, oh, i got to go to um, play basketball or a garden roof party or something, mm, according to the trailer. And I don't want to talk to my friends. I just want to keep playing my game. Yeah, and you can now, because then you sort of, inside the, the actual guts of the console is a screen. You pull out a screen, and then you whack the left and right side off your controller, and you whack them onto the screen, and the game just automatically switches from your TV to the screen, and then off you are playing it. Mm, and it's like, like magic. Yeah, and then, like, I see Jacinta and go, hey, you, you Mario Kart, that'd be better than talking to each other, right? And you go, fuck yes. <laughs> so we put the screen on a little stand, and we pull off both sides of the controller, and mm. instead of pushing them together into a voltron pretty piss poor too, like Voltron, Voltron, uh, <laughs> voltron Instead, we take a half each, and it's little mini controllers, and Mm. then we're playing. So, you know, it can do anything. Mm. Like, uh, there's... And you look at the future, like, the the, the possibilities. Did you see there was 
fan-made concept art of the kinds of things that maybe could be a possibility. Like, they had this idea of, okay, you've got Yoko, Yo- a Yokai watch. Yep. And in Yokai watch, there's a little disc that you spin to yep. attack and everything. What if, for that game, you snap on a new peripheral, which goes on the right-hand side, which has a little disc? Yeah. You know, what if... You're hungry while you're eating games, so you put on a thing on the side mm. which uh, just squirts ranch dressing into your mouth. Mm-hmm. While or, you're playing, like, go-go cooking mama. Yeah, or, or it's, like, it made out of pizza on one side, mm-hmm. and you can just eat it, and then, oh, well, yeah. that came off, but I'll get another pizza out of the freezer and just slab that on the mm-hmm. side. I'm thinking of you, America. I'm thinking of the sorts of things that you might <laughs> like. Uh, you know, fries come out the bottom or something like that. I don't know, but... Uh, just endless possibilities, very different from the other systems. The idea that I don't play as much PS4 or anything at the moment because I don't like to be sort of stuck down by the TV down there. Mm. Um, I like to be up here and watching movies and stuff as well and, and, and doing whatever. And I could. I could play a game or watch it a movie at the same time up here in my mm. little office. I would love that. So uh, it comes out in March. Um, I'm pretty keen, except the only problem with Nintendo is during, during the lifespan of most of their systems, I feel like there's only really, you know, maybe a dozen games that are really, really good. Like, I've got the Wii U. I love the Wii U. The games on there are, that I have are great, but I, I don't have many. Mm. Like, compared to some of the other consoles, I've got, you know, in its life, I'll have 150 games. Yeah. My Nintendo ones, I always have a small amount by comparison. But those small ones I have, I love. Yeah, there's a lot of, um, I don't know if it's just rumour or just talk or whatever, that um, perhaps they will have, you know, a download or a subscription service where you can access a lot of those really old legacy games. Mm, okay. um, to be able to download them to the, the new console. And it showed at the end of the trailer, that was Skyrim. Yeah, they, they, they yeah, were playing yeah. Skyrim. Mark. Yeah, so there's going to be some um, kind of third-party crossover yeah. happening there. I assume, again, with older games, they're not going to bring out um, new, release, yeah. new release games to the Wii, but oh, sorry, to the new Nintendo system, but um, yeah, that's that's kind of interesting too because portable whole, Skyrim, no one else is doing that. You can't play Skyrim on a plane. Yeah, and the whole thing with Nintendo and what Nintendo's always done is it all it's about um, social gaming. Yeah, and this is just really bring taking it out of your lounge room and just expanding it even more. So it, it's as yeah. the slogan goes: Nintendo does what those nine turds don't. Mm-hmm. Of which I mean, Microsoft. Sony, <laughs> yeah, in the other seven, yeah, yeah, yeah. They sure showed that Atari. Fuck yeah! Where, <laughs> where's Atari now? Huh? Oh, king of nothing, in my opinion. Trailers. Yeah. To God, that was just the news. That was. Well, this is a jam-packed week. Sometimes the weeks are jam-packed. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two. Mm. We're told this isn't really a trailer. It's not a tease of a trailer. It's just a bit of stuff to sort of get us. Excited, yeah. But I was pretty comprehensive, really. Yeah, well, you see all the characters, you get a little bit of banter there, and yeah. And I like fun. that it's really the the meat of it is a little character moment between Star Lord and Drax, yeah. and the fact that it, it's not about the MacGuffin or mm. any sort of gubbins. That it's about here are characters that you really love, and here is them, here are them doing character things and developing their characters further. Yeah. It's just that's just really smart. I mean, they mm. they understand the appeal of this stuff and and why it works. And um, yeah, I'm just really. Mm. I mean, everybody's behind this. Everybody's going to be excited for Guardians too. Um, mm. I mean, I, I I enjoyed the trailer. I thought, oh yeah, no, that's quite nice. Oh, I was I was, I was, a, I was a bit confused why um, Groot was wearing clothes, but um, what I loved is that teaser poster. Oh, yeah, oh, it's the black and white me. one. Yeah. That, they look it's so beautiful. cool. They look like yeah. the coolest people ever, and I want to be their friends. And that's God. Like, look at that. Like, like, just look at that little bit of style and art direction that changes everything. Mm. Compare that to that really awkward first reveal of Suicide Squad, mm. you know, where they're all standing... Yeah, um, in a line-up. line-up yeah. apart from each other and just looking really sort of awkward, whereas this one's... Just so stylish. Mm. Yeah. So, come on. They're, they're doing it right. Yeah. It's great. And uh, then sort of on the other end of the spectrum for me is... And it's not a bad trailer at all. And I know a lot of people love this. I think it's intriguing enough as a sort of 
movie trailer, but is it a Wolverine movie trailer? And I'm talking about Logan, Mm. um, which is the old man Logan set in a sort of more of dystopian future. Professor X is there. um, Logan's there. Hugh Jackman doesn't even have the Wolverine hair anymore. There's just nothing for me there that... It's like, the music's good, but there's nothing there that connects what I want to see out of Wolverine or Professor X or why I like those characters. Mm. Like, there's just nothing to... to li- I'm always hoping every time there's a new X-Men thing come out that I'm finally going to see things that feel comic booky. And it's not like I want them to be like the comic books and follow those storylines or anything, because I think a lot of that stuff's shit. But I love how... Marvel, whether it's Guardians or Avengers or Doctor Strange or whatever, has given us those comic characters in real life. And I'm always thinking, finally, are they just going to go, fuck it, let's find a way for Wolverine to wear a costume and just go nuts. Mm. And and let's really see that Wolverine from the comics. Or let's see this character or whatever. And they just never fucking do it. Mm. They came close with Apocalypse. But they just filled it with so much bullshit and characters standing around. And then, you know, towards the end of Apocalypse, you finally see them in costumes which are close to the comic book and I think oh suddenly this visually is just lifted immensely like now I'm kind of like I want to see this team and then that's the end of the movie Mm. and it's like fucking just give me something Mm. what do you feel about this (laughs) Um, I thought it was like a really nice trailer like if this was any other movie than a Wolverine movie I would still go oh that looks like a a really solid trailer for a movie Um, at this point having been disappointed by two Wolverine movies uh, and some two X-Men movies uh, Days of Future Past and Apocalypse uh, well yeah I went in with uh, tempered expectations for those so I probably wouldn't say I was disappointed Uh, but yeah I, I kind of like I don't care that much at this point like if it entertains me then that's enough i was done with i'm not done in terms of look i'm never gonna be i'm not gonna see this movie i'm gonna fucking see everything and um and i want everything to surprise me Mm. uh but and hugh jackman initially as wolverine really did surprise me when Mm. you know when i first heard he was cast i was like that is fucking crazy bonkers and um, and then he was fantastic. Mm. Like, he really sold it. I was like, oh, shit, he's Wolverine. But when I watched The Wolverine, which I don't think is a terrible movie, the, you know, the Japan one, I f- mm. and I think I said at the time, like, f- for me it just felt like, and all the X-Men stuff's like this at the moment, just another episode in an expensive TV series. Or like the Bond films where you go, mm. oh, is that the one with the big samurai in it and you kind of remember the good bits of all of the movies Mm. but none of the movies really hold together as great movies by themselves um and also you have to be invested because like i don't even if you love that the wolverine movie you're not going to be able to give it to just anybody and then go oh oh yeah i like this as well you've got to be invested yeah i mean i like wolverine but i found that movie a bit boring yeah yeah and people are like, oh, you know, how exciting this Professor X and everything. And I go, yeah, yeah, cool. That is cool. But everything I love about Professor X, none of it's shown in that trailer. It's just Pat- it's Patrick Stewart in mm. that trailer. It's Patrick Stewart in a laying in a hammock or whatever. But, you know, show me something. And it's early. Like, mm. let, let's be fair. It's mm. early. They haven't done but. I feel like with the X-Men movies, I feel like it's going to be the same with the, the Power Rangers because I, I imagine we'll get a um, Power Rangers trailer soon, you know, closer to release, which is the action thing, that they aren't that full of surprises. Like, most of the action shots and everything you're going to see in the trailer, like mm. they just never have the budget or the ingenuity to really push that stuff. Whereas in the Marvel movies, in... The Star Wars movies, there's always a big chunk of stuff that you just have never seen. Mm. You know, you go in and and it gets revealed and there's all these great shots and stuff. Whereas all the cool shots in Apocalypse, I'd seen before Mm. I went into the movie. Same with Fantastic Four. And I feel like it'll be the same with this. We'll get the sort of action-y one. But most of this movie will be pretty low-key characters talking Mm. and doing things and getting from A to B. which, Which is what these films have become. Mm. Whereas, you know, that first X-Men movie, the, the very original one with Brian Singer directing, it's so low budget, but so clever with the powers. Like, I fucking love that sequence where, you know, he's talking to Magneto through Sabretooth and 
Magneto's mm. got all the guns and everything trained yeah. on the people. And yeah. it, it's just, again, Patrick Stewart sitting in a car, but it's a really clever use of those powers and mm. you just understand how it all works. And So, look, I hope it's good. I've read the old man Logan comics and I know it'll, it'll be just the most Vegas sort of mm. premise kind of thing. But they were really cool. But they also had um, a hillbilly family of hulks <laughs> and uh, a lot of other crazy stuff happening. Oh, which, what a uh, shame they don't have the license for we're that. We're not going to see. So, <laughs> I don't know. But uh, when I watched the Japanese one, I was like, now you're Wolver Dad. You're, mm. you're like, you're past this. And Hugh Jackman knows he's past this. Mm. But the other thing is, he's just too nice a guy. We said this with Eddie the Eagle. I just don't believe him in that role. I can't see Hugh Jackman aside from it. Mm. And that's fine with characters like, you know, Robert Downey Jr. obviously is very similar to Tony Stark and he adopts that persona. But Hugh Jackman is not Wolverine, never has been. He's play acting, he's playing pretend and I see through it through it too much now. So they're going to have to work really fucking hard to surprise me. Mm. There you go. Yeah. Oof. Poor Logan. God. Oh, snick, well. snick. Look at me rip <laughs> into that. <laughs> And uh, finally, a, a trailer that isn't actually new this week. It's a couple of weeks old. I only just became aware of it. Army of One, which is from the director, Larry Charles, who directed um, Borat, and I believe was uh, heavily involved in Seinfeld. He, he's done this film. It's going to be on demand, 15th of November, I think. So I'll, I'm definitely going to watch it. And it stars Nicolas Cage just going fucking mental. Going the full Nicolas Cage. The full Nicolas Cage, just really pushing it as this um, sort of fat, greasy, grey ponytailed American guy... Called Gary. Called Gary, who believes that he hears the voice of God, played by... Russell Brand. Who tells him that he must go to Pakistan and find and kill Osama bin Laden. Mm. So Gary does what he can... Based on a true story. to get over Which is actually not surprising. (laughs) And um, hunt down Osama, and it it looks really crazy and Mm. uh, fun and funny. So, mm. I'm keen. Yeah, you can watch that one, buddy. Yeah, yeah. look, you either, uh, as we're going to say with a film we're reviewing later, <laughs> there, there's some things which um, are either going to annoy the shit out of you and you're just going to go, nope, mm. or, or you're going to watch. But uh, I, I'm excited about that. I, I recommend, if you're curious anyway, look at the trailer. It's called Army of One, starring Nicolas Cage, directed by Larry Charles. Now, should we review some films that we actually have seen? That would probably be a good plan. We haven't just seen, you know, short clips rearranged by a marketing team. Mm. We've seen every shot in order, start to finish, Mm. credits, pre-credits to post-credits. Well, maybe not post-credits in all of them, because it would be silly to sit there post post the credits. I think we live in an age now we should always just take a chance, mm. you know, because you never know what's... Think, like, there might be a crazy sequel. Oh, yeah. Or a crossover. Yeah, okay. mm. Or, you know, a sting. It just makes <laughs> yeah. you go, oh, I, now I see that thing from before in a whole new light. Let yeah. Me, let mm-hmm. me tell you. Yeah. Hell or high water is what we saw this morning. Sure is. Opens uh, Thursday, so we got to see it a bit early. Mm. Or in Australia, at least. Yeah, I think it's been out a little bit earlier in the US. I have have seen people talking about it for quite some time. And uh, I had not seen a frame of this. I hadn't seen the trailer. I actually thought we were going to see a Western. I didn't even know who was in it, apart from Jeff Bridges. Mm. And it's kind of a Western, but a modern-day Western. Yeah, modern-day Western. So... Quite a few cars had gone by on the screen before I went, hey, oh. this isn't a Western. <laughs> um, so it's uh, Jeff Bridges, uh, Chris Pine and Ben Foster. Yeah. Uh, with Chris Pine and Ben Foster playing brothers who are kind of, well, not Robin Hoodish bank robbers, but but bank robbers. And Jeff Bridges is the, uh, the ranger trying to... Track them down and stop them them from what they're doing. This is such a great example of a simple story, very well Mm. told. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And it it had a sort of Fargo vibe. Um, Mm. And I say that in a broad sense, not like Fargo necessarily, the the original movie, but, you know, this could be a series of Fargo almost about these characters. Mm, Yeah, it's from the writer of Sicario, which is, I'm pretty sure that was in my top ten, if not my top five last year. That was a movie I really loved. So, and it's got a pace which is 
reasonably gentle, mm. but you know that it's heading for no good. Yeah. And you're kind there's of a, There's waiting. a sense of foreboding yeah. hanging over it. Not in the same way as Sicario, because that was a very heavy yeah. sense of foreboding. Um, this is just like, you're like, ooh, just something, something's going to happen just around the corner and we don't know which corner it is yet. Yeah, these characters are very sort of slowly heading towards each other. And, yeah. and you know that once they get together, mm. you know, some shit's going to happen. Yeah. And uh, what struck me is it's very well written. It's funny, mm. but in a sort of... Very cl- dry. Yeah, yeah, dry sort of clever way. Like, where you sort of chuckle and you just go... Like, like it, it's about the characters, isn't it? The mm. characterization and um, development and everything is very strong. I thought it was a, quite exposition-y at the beginning. Mm. But um, I really cared about yeah. everybody. Yeah, and they're not... Like, massively chatty characters. You know, sometimes you see a movie and there's characters just like, talk, 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 yeah. this is who I am, but da, da, da. And these, you know, characters, like, it was... The script is very economical with words. You can mm. you can work these characters out very quickly just by how they are interacting with it, with each other, particularly um, Jeff Bridges' character and uh, his partner, played by Gil Birmingham, their relationship straight away. Yeah. Within minutes, you you got them, you got who they were, who they were to each other, and, and that sort of thing. And Bridges isn't playing a huge range in this, really. Like, his character's pretty mellow for a mm. lot of it, but he's it's such a commanding performance still, mm. really engaging, just someone who's so confident, has mm. so much presence. Very mumbly, but... Can't understand <laughs> anything he's saying. I believe that, you know, Texan subtitles is fine. He sounds mm. like he's got a bowling ball in his mouth. <laughs> Uh, he makes Bane sound eloquent. <laughs> but all part of the character. Yeah. 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 Really endearing. And the standout performance for me, and I feel like Chris Pine is more, in The Two Brothers, is more of an anchor. Mm. He, he's the more relatable, solid character. And seeing him do something like this is really great. He, mm. He's totally up to it. And um, he, he was wonderful in a dramatic role, but... The standout for me was the sort of loose cannon brother, which was Ben Foster. Mm. And I always think of Ben Foster as, speaking of X-Men, as Angel in X3, which was a billion years ago. And um, he's certainly grown and changed and matured. Mm. And he was just wild. Yeah. It was a really great performance. Mm. Uh, just 100% committed to everything he was doing. And, um, yeah, it's really magnetic. I thought he was, this is picking of X-Men again. Um, I just thought he was fantastic. So, you know, the story's so simple. You almost don't want to spoil anything else. You just want to go along with that ride. But it's mm. just a really nice ride. I don't know if it's, say, just to go sort of back to our scale and thinking about who our audience really are. I don't think it's a rush out and see it at the cinema. Mm. But I think that it, it's it, one of those things that if you have that opportunity to see... Yeah, do do see it. It's a very, it's a really mature movie, and I mean that in a, obviously a very good way. Um, it does just have that nice, gentle pace, but it also it looks beautiful. Like there were mm. some shots early on where they're just standing, I think, on the side of the road, leaning against fence posts or something, and just it fucking amazingly beautiful. And of course, it's also going to open here in the same day as Doctor Strange, so yeah. we know what what you're going to be rushing off to see, but. Um, I think at the very, very least, if this is one of those things where you're, you know, browsing Netflix and it pops mm. up, like, you know, watch it for sure. I, yeah. I would give it a four. Yeah, I definitely solid four for me too. Yeah, I, and that is a very solid four. Yeah, and I think uh, definitely top 20 for me at this point, uh, depending on what else comes out, maybe sneaking into the end of top 10. Yeah. I just think it's just such a nicely crafted... Um, movie again. It may not be one that I would definitely watch again straight away, but I think just the in the same way that I love Sicario, I think it's just such a nicely, just everything works. Yeah, there's yeah. not a lot that I can really, really pick apart with this movie. No, it's uh, very well put together. Mm. I think that's a tricky thing, and obviously we'll get to our top ten list at the end of the year. And and these, as we continue to do this podcast, I think those lists become more and more informed because. Mm. We started out watching 20 movies and picking 10, and now mm. we watch, like, 100 movies and pick 10. Um, and we see a really wide range of genres. Mm. But I, I think they, they come down to... It's always that battle between going, well... Is it a good movie, or was it just that I enjoyed it? Yeah, is it yeah. something that I absolutely love and will watch infinitely? Mm. 
which is really what my top 10 is about as opposed to was it one of the best made movies and and really like if you i I had to be uh, you know um try and be as objective as possible mm. and say, well, what are the best movies of the year? Mm. Yeah, you know, it, it's sort of up there on on that scale. Um, I don't think there's any real need to watch it again. Um, it's not... You know, there are certain films where you just go, oh, I really want everybody to see this now. Like, Tickled was like that for me. Mm. It was like, oh, I just went on this great journey. I, I really think people will enjoy this journey too. Like, go and, go and watch that. Um, but uh, th- this is gentler. Mm. But, yeah. Good, good stuff, and uh, I never would have seen it if uh, we hadn't got the like Luna sort of invite thing. It just wasn't on my radar at all. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I probably I would have checked it out later because I had heard um, I hadn't heard a lot of people talking about it, but the people that did talk about it were very, very positive about it. Yeah. So it was on my radar to check out. But yeah, again, we're very lucky to get get these um, preview screening. And that name again, because I always get frustrated when people are talking about something for a long time, and I think. I don't really remember what this was called. Hell or high water. Yeah, they're, yep. they're your two options. <laughs> you have to, when you go into the cinemas, like half of the cinema is hell and half of it is high water. So you That's have to right. choose uh, which side. Like Just, when we went to the Civil War screening and yeah. uh, we got split up. Red side, blue side. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you want to talk about Train? Yeah. So Train to Busan is a, a Korean movie. Uh, which has had quite a few... Like, there's Korean film festivals and stuff that kind of crop up uh, all around, um, well, especially in Australia. I don't, I don't know if this happens in the US. Uh, showing a lot of, uh, you know, the, the best movies out of, out of South Korea over the year. And Train to Busan was one that has been having uh, a lot of mentions. And, uh, I, you know, I, I enjoy Asian cinema, so I thought I would... We definitely check it out, and uh, so *Train to Busan* is a Korean zombie movie, which the other week when I uh, reviewed *Girl with All the the Gifts*, uh, I sort of said that you know maybe I was a bit tired of a lot of zombie yeah. stuff, and uh, it was hard to really think of anything that was gonna, I guess, excite me or new situations or action action sequences that would uh, kind of get me excited about zombies again. But damn, *Train to Busan* did that. Zombies on the train. Yeah, so it's a bit like. You know, Walking Dead crossed with Snowpiercer. Yeah. Something like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, where these characters, they sort of get... Um, or, uh, they're going on a train from... Um, I don't know if he's in Seoul or wherever. They're going to, to Busan where the little daughter's mum is at the moment. So they're on this train. They're travelling. There's a, a nationwide outbreak of this sort of virus or whatever's happening. Everything it, goes to shit while they're on the train. Yeah, so it's all very vague. Like, there's not a heap of very specific backstory. It's just like something bad is happening, now we're dealing with it. And, um, yeah, there, there's some things happen on the train and they have to kind of fight on the train and it's just that, that enclosed sense of danger that really sells it. And the zombies are so fucking scary. They're the creepy fast zombies. Fast zombies. Uh, it's stylish. It's inventive. Mm. Um, great characters. And some really memorable shots. Uh, I can't yeah. spoil my favourite shot. I'm going to talk to you about it afterwards. But yeah. there, there was definitely a moment where I was like, oh, I've never seen this before. This is really yeah. cool. and there's a lot of stuff where it's like, okay, it's a zombie movie, a lot of people are going to die. But some of those deaths, you sort of go, oh, that was really nicely done or I kind of yeah. haven't seen it done like that before. Or, yeah, it was... I, I really enjoyed this movie. I just um, wish I'd seen it in the cinema. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, absolutely. That sort it was. Of movie. I kept seeing it on the things, but we always had other stuff that yeah. we had to prioritize over it. Um, but it was. It's really great, and if you do have the opportunity to see it in the cinema, then really, I highly recommend it. And then uh, the final film. Now, th- this is a bit of an outlier, and I absolutely loved this film. And I think if you've got a certain sensibility, you need to see this film. But it, it, a lot of people are going to hate it. It is deliberately alienating uh it's disgusting and confronting and weird but i'm talking about the greasy strangler um which is the film by this guy i think his name's jim hoskins and he's done a lot of advertising and and done commercials starring really weird eccentric sort of awkward characters and um it's produced by ben wheatley who did high rise Mm. and um elijah wood as well and it doesn't have anybody you would know really in it and everybody in it is really gross and weird and naked as much as possible. 
and sort of low IQ. There's that sort of feeling like nobody can act, but it's very deliberate. Mm. And they're sort of awful characters, and they have dumb conversations and circular conversations. But the film is actually really stylish. And the thing that sold me, I read this description, I think it was on Letterboxd, where somebody said it was like um, Napoleon Dynamite meets The Room meets Todd Solon's um, Trapped in a Tim and Eric sketch. Mm. which I think is not a bad description. Yeah, I could not think... Yeah, when I was watching it, it was very much the room meets Napoleon Dynamite. It's very yeah, hard very... To, to, to describe. Yeah, it's almost as if someone's done... It's like doing the room on, but on purpose. There's like this... Yeah, but with a lot more. Like, it does have craft. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, and, yeah it, and it absolutely. does have style, um, and it's, it's very knowing. But um, it's like, yeah, this gross guy who lives with his dad, who's also gross, and his dad puts a lot of grease on things when he mm. eats, which makes him keep saying, I suppose you think I'm the greasy strangler. And then there are stranglings that happen from a greasy man. And there's a relationship and a sort of love triangle between the dad and the son and this woman. And it is just crazy. Like, it's so impossible to describe. You can watch a trailer, but... Um, People will either absolutely loathe it, like will just go, oh my God, this, I can't watch this, this is terrible, or will just have so much fun. And I really have not laughed as much watching a movie this year as I did with that. I had just total belly laughs at just how stupid and crazy it mm. was. Some of those dumb conversations that go on for minutes and are just meaningless or horrible things the characters say or just crazy things they suddenly do. There's visuals in there where you're just like, what the fuck is going on? It kind of reminds me of although it's far more abstract, but I mean sort of the feeling of... One, one of my favourite books is um, Confederacy of Dunces, mm -hmm. uh, written in the 60s, I think, and uh, ended up winning the Pulitzer Prize only after the author had, couldn't get it published and committed suicide. But the protagonist in that is just the most disgusting, awful, rem, rem, like, unrepenting, irredeemable character. And I think the... And the book's funny but in a very dark satirical way and he mm. does horrible things and he doesn't learn anything from it and there are people that pick up that book i say i love that book and they start reading him they go oh this is such a i can't read this this mm. he's awful like i get no pleasure out of reading this and there are other people that just love you know just enjoy the shit out of it they just laugh and they go he's wonderful mm. and and i like that i like the larry davids and the george costanzas and the sort of it also reminded me of like um Daniel Klaus's comic work when he draws those really ugly, greasy, desperate people living mm. in squalor and um, having these just terrible lives. Oh, it just cracked me up. I just love it. I'll watch it again. I, I hope people out there, you know, there are people out mm. there that will get it. People, like, it's going to be such a fringe movie, but honestly, for me, it would be in my top ten because I just had so much fun and I almost wanted to just put it on again afterwards mm. i was hoping um <laughs> when you were watching it i was almost tempted to say like tell me when i'll put it on at the same time yeah um, no i watched it i watched it quite late last night but um yeah i look i didn't love it as much as you but can I, you understand why i ab did absolutely yeah. absolutely there was definitely stuff that um definitely stuff that made me laugh and yeah. there was stuff even i was driving to your house this morning and I thought of a scene and it made me laugh in the car. Yeah. Um, it's one of those things. It is like the room. Like, the time you're watching it, you're just going, what the fuck is this? But then it stays with you. Yeah. And you recall stuff from it and that makes you laugh. It really is a creeper in that way. It just kind of... Once you've seen it, you cannot unsee this movie. And... Um, it's so aggressively, like, audacious it is, and like, alienating. It ma yeah, it made... Like, you loved it. It made me very uncomfortable. Or made a me lot of it made me about. really fucking uncomfortable. Like just as an example, the dad who's interested in disco, a lot of the time when he goes out on dates and stuff, he's wearing this... Um, like a pantsuit kind of... Yeah, really kind of tight thing. pink thing. Everyone's either naked or wearing really tight clothes, and, and they're all really out of shape. And he's wearing this thing, and it's completely crotchless. 
And um, he's, it's got a prosthetic dick. Like, Massive. But he's got this big dick and huge pubes just hanging out <laughs> while he's going off and talking to people and having dates and And he's just, stuff. like, dancing with just, this yeah, massive cock. As if nothing yeah. is out of place. You know, just stuff like that, which mm. was just so... But all done in that really sort of quiet, indie, mm. artful film way. Like, there's mm-hmm. nothing about it which is sort of, yeah. you and know, this is, fratish. Or, this is one. When you see the, all the, the um, production companies and stuff come up at the start, there's all these, like, weird sort of titles. Yeah. There's one, like, little cartoon guy that, like, shits blood or whatever. I'm like, oh, okay, so this is where we are. And then it comes up with, like, BFI. British Film Institute yeah. or whatever. And so awarding funds from the National Lottery. Yeah, yeah. And there's people buying lotto tickets, paying for this movie where, well, a ma- a real... where an old man with a massive prosthetic sl- schlong gets it out. But I think that's the thing I want to make clear, and that's why I bring up Ben Wheatley and Elijah Wood or something, because mm. I think they really get this. Mm. They, they see this sort of dark, funny anti-film, which mm. isn't like The Room a result of incompetence. It's actually the result of really... Like, I think there's a really competent guy mm. behind this who knows exactly what he's doing. Yeah. And it's the same way, um, just to bring up comics again, and, and um, these references, we, we do have comic people, um, but, like, Johnny Ryan's work, who does angry youth comics and all sorts of stuff, which is just really aggressively alienating and offensive. But you listen to interviews and stuff with him. He's a very smart, normal Mm. guy. And he also does work, uh, kids' work for Nickelodeon and stuff like that. So it's almost like a purging of this Mm. really crazy stuff. Mm. And, you know, entertainment is this sort of medium where you can do that. And I just think it's absolutely fascinating. And, you know, it makes me want to actually see some of those other things that Elijah Wood has been involved with in that sort of behind the scenes capacity. Cause I think he probably has a pretty good eye for that. And, mm. um, I've, I've never been interested in watching maniac, the movie where he plays the maniac that scalps people and does stuff like that. But, um, I have a feeling that's probably, um, that's more of a horror film, but mm. along the same lines. And anyway, this, the title greasy strangler. And if you, um, Google stuff, you'll see pictures of from screenings and or you know previews or whatever of Elijah Wood and everyone hanging out there wearing pink beanies that have mm. greasy written across them. <laughs> um, some of those lines are, and some of the character, like there's a character, one of his friends is called Oinka and has a pig nose for no reason. Yeah. Well, there is a reason, which you'll find out if you watch the film. But uh, yeah, so strange. Yeah, it is deeply, deeply weird. Um, but never boring. No, I, never. It never. just goes from one crazy thing to the next. Absolutely, you may need to be in the mood for it. I would say um, you, you've got you've got to sit at least five to ten minutes through it. Yeah, that, that, probably. That's my thing because for me, like, make sure you see the greasy strangler for the first time. Yeah, that was the that sort of just before that sequence where they're at the vending machine. That was the bit that maybe go. Oh, okay, this is like really yeah. funny. This is making me laugh because now. you don't necessarily get what they're going for at the beginning. Mm. Like I remember watching that first sequence, the first conversation, and sort of being kind of amused, but not knowing what I was watching. And I didn't know who it was produced by. I didn't know if this was just this oddity from some weirdo mm. or what it was. I didn't know what the tone was. I didn't know if it was deliberate, if it wasn't deliberate. And I was just, mm. like, really kind of wary of it. Mm. But then by the time I got to that, yeah, the vending machine scene, when you first see the greasy strangler, yeah. I was like, oh, no, these guys are just having a fucking blast. Yeah. Like, this is just such an interesting film. But certainly not for everybody. I know mm. people that I recommend films to a lot, friends who, who listen or that I talk to in real life and say, you know, I know a handful of those that I normally love all this, the things that I recommend that would hate it. Mm. Suzanne would hate it. Um, you know, the, people just will not all like this, but, uh, it's an experience. And if you, yeah, I would, yeah, I can't, I recommend the experience, but I, I didn't personally love the movie. It's a really weird one. Like I would say, yeah, watch it, but I, I'm not in a hurry to watch this again. Uh, yeah, and I, I'm the opposite. It's one of the best of the year. I fucking loved it so much. The <laughs> Greasy Strangler. It's the title. I, I just is my favourite thing. Mm-hmm. It's so good. I'm a film called The Greasy Strangler. Uh, so, yeah, look it up uh, and, and watch it. Now, that is the bulk of our show, but I believe we're going to do another instalment of Fuck Yeah Westworld. We sure are. Where we uh, get into spoiler territory for the third episode of the Westworld series, which we are still very much enjoying. So um, if you haven't caught up yet, and um, 
uh, it's nice to see that uh, there are a couple of friends on the um, Facebook group that uh, hadn't watched Westworld that after we did that went, oh, I'm going to stop and I am actually going to watch it. And mm. then went, oh, this is really good. Yeah. So um, give yourself that experience. Don't go, oh, I don't know when I'll get around to watching it, so I'll listen to this anyway. Don't listen to this no, if you no, haven't no, watched no. it. Um, just go now. But if you have watched it, then please uh, join us for the spoiler-filled Westworld Episode 3 talk uh, happening in a minute. If you're leaving us, thanks so much for listening. Please remember, rate reviewers on iTunes. That's just the most important best way you can help us uh, we've got our patreon as well um book was better still on hiatus i'm sorry about that but there's been no public outcry or anything or strangers messaging me saying where is it or anything it's just kind of disappeared and life goes on so but i i I'd still would love to do it I, i'd certainly love to do something with it at the end of the year if nothing else and um because i'll have holidays and yeah go to our facebook page you can find links to all this shit at fruitlesspursuits.com yeah. All right. Westworld spoilers are starting now. Now, you watched this more recently. You watched it again. So do you want to lead us into to battle? Mm. So this uh, episode three was called The Stray for very good reason. So there's uh, a stray in it. There was a stray in it. Uh, we don't kind of get to see mainly towards the, until towards the end. Mm. Uh, but they, the- they close in on um, Anthony Hopkins soap and sure enough there is a stray a gray yeah right on that bar absolutely um yeah most of the episode uh, is, seems to be dealing with uh the fact that these char- well, the robots the hosts uh that their memories aren't being wiped as well as people think yeah and they're starting to uh retain memories from previous mm. lives i just hope they're wiping them front to back mm-hmm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's mainly Dolores, so our rancher's daughter. I'm going to learn their names eventually. Yeah. Uh, Dolores I've got, and Teddy yeah. I've got. Yeah, Dolores and Teddy we've got. Um, the others I have no fucking idea. I don't even think I know what Anthony Hopkins' name is. I don't know. Um, and then there's the prostitute character. She's starting to have a few flashbacks as well. She yeah. was the one that escaped the week before. Um, and she sees Teddy and that kind of triggers a memory in her of previously when she'd seen his sort of corpse getting washed out uh, in the previous episode. So, yeah, this, the cracks are starting to, to show there. And it's an episode that thematically seems to be a, a, all about backstory. Mm. Yeah, Teddy gets a new backstory. And um, we, we get the guy that's investigating all this and investigating Dolores and everything. Mm. We found out about his backstory with the kid. Mm. And we get insight into Anthony Hopkins' backstory with this uh, Arnold. Arnold, yeah. Who was his partner. and um, Seems to be influencing some of the hosts in some way. Yeah, so Arnold wanted everybody to, the, the robots, to gain consciousness, mm-hmm. essentially. That was his ultimate goal, making them so real that they became conscious Mm. and there's that thing about the maze where at the center of the maze you'll find your freedom Mm. so i feel like the maze because we don't know what it is yet but my speculation would be that that is something that arnold has put in there as a kind of classic bit of quest iconography Mm. the idea that if one of these robots can become self-conscious they will find their way th- through the maze. They will go off the loop and go into the maze, yep. work their way through it, and whatever challenges they have to face in there, if they manage to do it, they will be able to go out and, and be free as mm. a, a person and not a robot. And so my that's my theory. And then so Man in Black, Ed Harris, is obviously trying to subvert this or do something with that. To He's interested in finding out more about that. Well, a lot of people are saying that he is Arnold. Could be. Yeah. But then, yeah, I don't know. But then, then yeah, again, it's weird. Like, why would um, Anthony Hopkins' character let him be in the park? Yeah. If, I, he's, I, if there's so many issues there. I feel like more that... I don't know. I get the impression that he's been going there for 30 years. He must be incredibly, incredibly wealthy. Mm. Um, I I reckon he's like the richest dude there and I don't know I just feel like you know when you approach a game like let's take Warcraft for example Mm -hmm. okay you you play Warcraft and your initial thing is that sense of wonder you buy into the world completely 
you're walking around and going, what's around this corner? Oh, there's a swamp. Oh, shit, there are murlocs in mm. this thing. I'm going to go fight them. I'm going to gather this. And you are really interested in the world. And then you go around a corner and there's the big city, Stormwind for the first time. Yeah. And you're like, oh, shit, look at this. And everything is discovery. And you put yourself there and you feel like you're there. But then that second phase, once you've played it for a lot, is you start to see the scenes. Mm. You go, well, this area is just a rectangle like this, which mm. joins to this rectangle. And I can go here and here. And, and you kind of understand the way it works. Mm. And then I feel like you're third final journey with a game is how do I subvert that? Mm. How do I poke at it? How do I get into that area that I'm not supposed to get into? How mm. do I do this? How do I find the loopholes? And I wonder if Ed Harris's character after doing this stuff for 30 years is like, well, I need to get more out of this thing and, and really sort of poking at it, pushing at it. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I think he would have to have a connection to mm. to the, the larger story yeah. in some way. But um I almost feel like, yeah, he's just sort of wanting to go and break the game. And I couldn't recall whether the stray was somebody that he'd fucked with in a previous episode or not, or if that was... Yeah, that's the thing. Like, everybody looks the same at the moment for me. And the other weird thing is, like, especially with the hosts, it's... Like, with, a, you know, a lot of characters in a normal TV show, you find things out about them and you're, like, you're shocked as to their backstory, mm-hmm. you know, how that's fitting into the story. With the host, that's changeable at a second's notice. So, yeah. if something, even if you find out something about them, that could change the next episode completely. Yeah. So, it's, yeah, you're always on a bit of a tightrope with as far as the hosts go. So, it's only really the humans that we have, I guess, a solid um, line. Yeah, because... That stray, um, you know, they're just trying to get his head to get mm. the control core or whatever it is to, to get that information yeah. out of him, and he chooses to smash his head. Yeah. Um, thereby, I assume, obliterating, uh, obliterating that information, unless, you know, you'd hope these people had the cloud with all their te- mm. technology, but clearly not if you have to go down and mm. um, pull their head off. Yeah. So, with yeah. With a big old knife. Oh, and fuck me. You know how it's probably last two weeks you keep saying to me yeah and you see the other Hemsworth brother now and I'm like no I don't know which one he is. as <laughs> soon as that guy came on I was just like oh you fucking idiot like <laughs> he's this the most Hemsworthy looking guy huge hulking blonde guy <laughs> with tiny eyes and uh, a bit of Australian twang on the end of his American accent yeah and I was like yep yeah, I got this now yeah 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 He's, he's pretty Hemsworthy. Like. I had a bit of a a bit of a Hemsworth head palm. blindness. Yeah, yeah. I just wasn't thinking about that guy. I was thinking about it, it's funny. Like you do get very focused on that Western, mm. the West world, the world itself. The, like, well, everybody else is just like, no, no, go away. We want to, we want to go yeah. back to the yeah, yeah. So it's intriguing, and of course we had the. Uh, Slight progression with Dolores in the sense that she killed the fly in the first one and now mm. she was able to squeeze the trigger. Um, oh, I love that bit where they talk about there's the axe and there's like eight guys working yeah. here and only one and of them's allowed to, to touch yeah. it. Yeah. Just, uh, I'm very interested in the process, how yeah. it all works. Yeah. Um, was there a player piano bit of music this time? There was. I couldn't identify it. I wasn't sure what it was. I was going to Google it before. Um, this to find out what it was, but I did not do that. So no, if anybody wants either. to enlighten us as to which uh, world song it was, but um, yeah, a lot of people are still talking about. Uh, oh god, I don't even know what the character is called. Ben Barnes's character, and they're I don't saying know who that Ben Barnes is the the guy with the McPoyle. With the what? So there's the, okay, so there's the two dudes. There's the whatever the intern guy. Oh, Lyle the intern. Lyle the intern and, and his friend. Prince Caspian. Prince Caspian, yes, okay. okay. All right, I'll call him Prince Caspian Thank from you. now on. Um, that people were sort of saying, well, that guy's got to get his come up and soon because he's a, he's a raging asshole, right? And um, people are saying, well, wouldn't it be funny if that, if he's the first person to go when Dolores finally snaps mm. and gets her shit together? And, well, she's with them now. I kind of wonder if. Like, HBO's got to have this big, larger plan here. And we're all waiting for the robots to snap. But is that like waiting for winter, where we could be in five seasons from mm. now? And it's like, I'm going to snap any time now. Yeah. Well, maybe it's like the whole series is just them putting Band-Aids over stuff. And you think, whoop, we're getting there. And they'll be like, oh, no, okay, we've kind of fixed yeah. that a bit. Like and Disneyland. then they find another, yeah. 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 And someone's head gets knocked off on Thunder Mountain. <laughs> yeah. Like, 
technical difficulties. Ryan shut didn't down. Didn't technically die here because his head flew over the fence. So there's still <laughs> no deaths at Disneyland. <laughs> so I've heard, allegedly. Um, yeah. I'm still, like, yeah, I'm still with the cost thing. It, it's still a big deal to me. Like, mm. I want to know how much they're paying, and I, I want to know how the whole finance side mm. works. Oh, you know, in along that train, what pissed me off is there was that guy, and he was, like, a tech guy, and he was obviously doing um, calibration or whatever, and he'd put a blanket over the dude. Yeah. Yeah? And then Anthony Hopkins goes, well, fucking, he doesn't feel cold. He doesn't yeah. feel shame. Get the blanket off him. I don't care if you don't want to look at his dick. Take the blanket yeah, off like, him. Get that cock out. And he's licking his lips like in Silence of the Lambs. Yeah, and then he takes a fucking scalpel and goes, they don't feel anything, then cuts down the guy's face. Yeah. Like, that's thousands of dollars to fix yeah. that. What are you doing? Imagine it was a car factory and he just ran his keys along yeah. the, the door or something. What, like, this is expensive merchandise. What are you doing? I still think, you know, we had that theory. I think it was last time. might have even been the time before when we did the no spoilers. That if everything's kind of 3D printed... Mm then I like the idea of you just mulch up this white material. Yeah. You just mulch everything up, broken tables, people, everything, mm -hmm. and then you reprint what you need. We yeah. need to print Dolores again. But we, it seems to be that they're cleaning and, and fixing up. And I'm thinking, a doctor wouldn't use the syringe again. Do I want to use Dolores after Ed Harris has been there for 30 years and God knows who else? It, like, mm. it, it feels like a safety thing to me. It seems like a kind of... It, it feels like putting on the grosser shoes in the bowling alley. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? But, you know, you've got the disinfectant spray. They just go... Up the yeah, but then and... you're putting a lot of faith in those guys. <laughs> and I understand. And then you start to think and you go, well, your average dishwasher's not paid much or whatever. I'm using mm. a knife and fork at a restaurant. Mm. You know, I don't know whose mouth... That's been in and how well it was cleaned. Yeah. But um, it's yeah, be chair. Like if I'm paying a lot of money to have sex with a robot, I kind of want one that's factory fresh. <laughs> you know. You know, like when you get a tattoo, you have to sign that thing saying I saw the needle opened in front of me. Yeah. I want to see the robot opened up like in the prince package. Well. Yeah. <laughs> you want to see I'm the robot's package. I want to see it real opened up. If you get my drift, I want to see that exhaust port. Great shot, kid. That was one oh. in a million. <laughs> Ugh. Uh, yeah. Was it pre or post? Nah. That was post. Yeah, so I, I find that tricky. And then I thought, when, when you're talking about the man in black and maybe he's like the richest dude there, I would like to see them leave a card there and every time they kill or break something, mm. it's itemised. It's like a hotel. Like, you see that get added. Oh, yeah. Taken so it's off on your, their card. your account, yeah. So, like... Ed Harris goes batshit because he can mm. afford to go batshit. Mm -hmm. He's like, I'm going to kill all these dudes. Just fucking take it off my account. I don't yeah. give a crap. Whereas someone like um, Lyle, the intern, yeah. might have to be like, eh, do I want to shoot this guy? Or maybe I'll save up my money I put aside for shooting a guy for somebody a bit more important down the track. Mm. Though I get the impression that um, Lyle, the intern, is there as a guest of Prince Caspian. And maybe Prince Caspian's paying for him. Do you reckon? Yeah, I That's think pretty I good. I feel oh, it's for his so. back. Like it's a, it's a, are they it's having like a bachelor bachelor's party? kind of thing? I think. Yeah, yeah. maybe. So I, I'd like to see that. I'd like to sh cut to the screen where you see just like mini bar items mm. being sort of expended. Um, yeah, you, you, go, you put your little um, credit card into the into the shattered skull of the guy you just murdered, and just put in your little pin code, and it just gets taken off your your tab. Should be automatic, I reckon. Oh, yeah, okay. I, I just, just want like to see the you just touch it to his ear. Well, I, I think they're just because they're monitoring everything. Well, yeah. So someone just goes, oh, yeah, killed a, killed three dudes. Type type type, and mm. then the the money goes up, mm. and it's a little even that could be itemized, like cleaning, skull repair, etc., etc. Yeah. I hope we find out about the finances of Westworld at yeah. some point. Yeah. And um, I hope that even though they're in a sort of advanced society and things have changed, that we get to see the hideous gift shop at the end of it. Oh, yeah. Like, because, I, I mean, come on. Like, even no matter how advanced we are in the future, we're always going to have hideous gift shops. If there's mm. ever a chance to, like, bilk a tourist out of a little bit extra... For, a, like, a $30 yeah. mug or key ring or something. Well, yeah, because... And Westworld's all about, um, like, fucking and killing, right? So... Yeah. I rate three prostitutes all... and all I got was this lousy T-shirt. Yeah, or, like, customised fleshlights. Like, yeah. you you banged her. Now, here's a little take-home version of her vagina. 
Oh, it's just one of the um, like old sockets that we're not using anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah the recycling. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Send them down to the gift shop. That one's mm. uh, coming apart a bit. <laughs> the scenes. <laughs> yeah, very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I want to know more about yeah the theme park mechanics. Yeah, because yeah. uh, that's that's really the real story for me. Mm. How does that all operate? Mm. 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 Get on it, Westworld. Interesting. Any other thoughts? No, I think that was that was a bit. No, that was it. I I did have to watch this episode twice. I did. I watched it again yesterday because I just sort of kind of vagued out the first time because it didn't feel like there was any. Apart from at the end, like any kind of really huge huge moments yeah. um, for me. But uh, yeah, yeah. Look, at this point, it's still world building. We're still working out how things fit together and then you know i guess once we we learn that then things are going to push forward quite a lot more so yeah we just have to kind of deal with it for now another cool bit of casting the guy that um she shoots in the dolores shoots in the barn Mm. is uh, speaking in grand theft auto is trevor from grand theft auto oh yeah also the um creepy locksmith in broad city (laughs) so cool to see him Stephen Ogg. i love him yeah cool there you go. All right. Well, that's it. Thanks for listening, well people, to our ramblings. Um, See you next week for Doctor Strange. Yeah, we're seeing Doctor Strange on Wednesday. Yeah. Shit, son. I'm not hearing great things about it. I've heard, oh, it looks nice. I've heard <laughs> it's really trippy, <laughs> but formulaic and one of the lesser Marvel movies. Yeah. But the or- origin ones are going to really, be. It like, is. This is just this is eating your vegetables so that you can Before have the dessert yeah. of him appearing in a better movie later on yeah. alongside and he's already the been other confirmed characters. For Infinity yeah. War. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. we'll get there. But uh, we'll go do that and uh, talk about it next week. So uh, okay, thanks. Bye. Bye. Camelot. Camelot.